My name's Drew Wade. I was a DP for The Bear, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hello, and welcome to The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. My name is Ben Consoli, and today we speak with Andrew Wade, the director of photography of The Bear, uh, which is on FX, and I saw it on Hulu. It's such a good show. You guys are going to absolutely love the show if you haven't seen it, but whether you saw it or not, there is so much information to be gained in my interview with Andrew, so that is coming up in just a moment. Before I get there, I want to mention a couple of things. First of all, I want to thank David Patterson, who gave us a donation. He came and donated to the Go Creative Show. It warmed my heart, David, when I saw that donation come through. Uh, and if any of you guys, you love the show, you want to support, that's such a great way to, first of all, let us know that you like what we're doing, but also just support the show. Like, it, it's just so meaningful to us to know that you're listening, and then especially if you love us enough to support the show like that. So thank you so much, David, and for all of you guys that have donated in the past. I really appreciate it. And we also appreciate our listeners sending in their questions. And today we actually have questions from Sam on Instagram at Bratface Media, Edward Vega, and Fabrizio. Mauricio Diaz, thank you all for asking questions, and we ask uh, Andrew your questions on today's show, so stay tuned for that. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com, and if I may, just for a moment, I want to mention a new project that I'm working on. I have been a musician my whole life. I've been in bands from when I was 14 years old all the way up to 28, 29 years old. I am now 42, so a lot of time has passed, but I am sort of rekindling my love of music and doing it with a great group of people. And we're called Three Second Chances. Uh, my buddy Joey Nico Terra and Jason Tremblay is our vocalist as well as me. And it, it, it is just so much fun to do this. It's such a creative outlet. And I know that a lot of people in the video and film industry are musicians and, um, you know, just sort of did it for a while, dabble in it still. But it, it's it's so fulfilling to me to be doing something musical again. And um, our first single is a Christmas single called When the Tree Goes Up. It's coming out on November 17th. You can see all about that at 3secondchances.com. And I'll be obviously posting about it on my personal Instagram at Ben Consoli. So I'm not going to use this platform to constantly talk about 3 Second Chances, but I'm just so excited about it. And I know that you guys as filmmakers can relate to a love of music. And many of you, I'm sure, are musicians yourself. So it's just a, a fun time for me. And I want to share it with all of you. So thank you guys for listening to the show and supporting the show. And I think it's time we jump into our interview with Andrew Wade, the director of photography of The Bear. Andrew Wade, welcome to Go Creative Show. How are you doing? I'm great. Nice to meet you, Ben. Nice to meet you too. And I actually just finished the last episode of The Bear today when I was cramming in the last two. Excellent. Excellent. So good. I mean, first of all, being having like a 20 to 30 minute show is so nice as a viewer. I'm curious how it feels as like on your side of things, as you know, on the production side of things. It, it, is, is a show at that length kind of an optimal length for cinematographers, for directors of photography? I mean, as a viewer, it's just great because you can go through them so quickly and you still get such an impact from a great show. It was, it, you know, what this show did to us is I felt like the consistency stayed very strong from start to finish because it was quicker, the stories were fast, and it allowed us to tell these stories that felt like we could take more creative chances and choices. Um, you know, longer shows, which I've been a part of, you have so many ups and downs and things that might slow the pacing down. We're here, Chris, as the creator, really just allowed uh, the visuals to match the story uh, impeccably. It was, it was an amazing experience. But also, to your point, we had episodes that were 20. We had episodes that were in the 30s. And we actually had episode 8, which was, I think, around 48 40 to 50. So. Yeah. yeah. So... And I can't even imagine, like, the pace of this show is so frantic. It's so chaotic. It's so wild. Like, I think 20, 30, 40 minutes <clears throat> is exactly what you can take as, yeah. as a viewer. It's just so jam-packed with chaos and intensity. For sure. It Actually, is. You know, and I was just going to say, episode eight is purposely slower in its pacing because it's longer. We knew that the audience needed 
to be able to get through it without that kind of pacing and speed that the rest of the episodes were going at. I want to talk about just the pace of the show and just what it feels like. Because like we mentioned, it's it's frenetic. It takes place in a kitchen. I think you guys do a really good job of like the feel of uh, of the behind the scenes of, you know, restaurant work and kitchen life and all of that. Um, but the pace is wild. It's chaotic. How do you create that in the cinematography? We approached the show obviously shot with two cameras. We approached each camera as its own unit. So it we allowed to create that speed through kind of the uh, voyeurism of the second camera constantly on a very long zoom, never changing, on a dolly, always moving. And it allowed the editorial team to choose when and where to, uh, you know, hijack the story through fast cuts and movements. Um, that lens was constantly moving. It was a 40 to 400, you know, it was 11 to one from Panavision that was adapted to full format. So, you know, we, st- we, we went as wide as a 40. I think we went as long as somewhere around a 400 millimeter and that camera just would slam into the, the action. And it was constantly looking and chasing you know, the momentum in the kitchen, whether it was chopping to serving to facial reactions to a line. And it really was like the glue to editorial. And it'll, and what it did is it actually freed up our A camera to tell the story through um, moments that we didn't have to cut. So it was very bipolar in a sense of like the A camera was designing a scene, whether it was a page to five pages in a way that if we chose to, we never had a cut from it. While the second camera was there shooting the shit out of it Mm -hmm. and shooting every single bit, every single angle all over the place and every take, we adjusted it. So we're constantly building up and building up this kind of library of information so that, uh, you know, when they got to that point, they could choose how they wanted to kind of unfold. And, you know, that's the luxury of the show is that there are scenes that don't cut. And it's purposeful and it makes sense. And then there's scenes that feel so phonetic that, you know, we needed all of the, you know, we needed that second camera there to constantly build up the, the story and, and the, the moments and the punctuations of what, you know, the, the, each script was trying to kind of highlight. So I want to make sure I'm understanding. So your A camera is kind of like your establishing shot, maybe where, where a majority of the content scene, you can live on it the whole time if you need to. And your B cam is where you're getting details. Uh, it's, it is a simple point. Yes. But the A camera is actually moving through the space. So as we treated the A camera as if it's the only camera. And so we would build compound moves in the kitchen, whether it was starting with, you know, Jeremy coming through the door coming into the kitchen, dropping his stuff down, going, you know, getting his knives out, pulling the food out of the fridge and going into prep and then going into line. So that A camera would build and design this entire shot while the second camera was essentially hidden in a way that would pick information that was happening that Jeremy was doing or Io was doing or Lionel was doing or whoever was doing. And and he was kind of the, the editorial camera so that, in the end of the day, when they got to edit, they're like, this is incredible. We don't want to leave Jeremy. We have that option, but, Oh, we actually want to build up tension here. Now we have all the tension there to get built up. And so it was a, an extremely fine tuned dance between two cameras that, you know, were given the freedom and creativity to live as their own kind of uh, unit. Now you shot episode two through eight. You didn't do the pilot, but you did everything else. Um, so you had, I mean, you were with this show basically the whole time. And, yeah. you know, I'm assuming that with that comes a lot of control and also comes a lot of efficiency because you're not swapping out crew, you're not swapping out um, right. camera departments. So what did that, um, like, what does it mean for you? What does it mean in the cinematography and the workflow and everything um, on a show where you are there from basically the beginning all the way through? We treated the show as a movie and that's really kind of why I think it hit so well. There's a consistency from two through eight and, you know, down to the me being able to design the stages to the lighting of the stages 
to, like you said, having a consistent crew. My operators were there every single day. My focus pullers were there every single day. And they're really like the ones behind the scenes that are creating this show. And I think, you know, with, you know, that consistency and that kind of, you know, we also shot the show in 27 days. We shot it in a movie schedule. We wrapped two days early because we were so efficient. And it comes down to things like the, the whole stage, the floor was designed to run without track. So we ran dollies on the floor that could go from the kitchen to the back to the front of house to the dining room without any track, without any transition points. And we did it all remote head. So we, so as that a camera had the opportunity, he could chase actors wherever he wanted. We could do these huge compound moves and we never had a weight on track or dance floor or anything. And same goes for the lighting, the entire, you know, the entire stage from the, you know, outside tungsten lights to the interior led lights were all, uh, you know, remotely controlled through our dimming board and we would have time of day. So like, well, we're shooting in the morning and we press a button and the whole within two minutes, the entire stage is in morning light or, you know, midday afternoon or night or whatever. And it was like, we could jump between scenes or jump between looks immediately. And those are the kind of things that we wanted to build and design from prep, knowing that, we knew that we knew what the pilot was. We all got to see the pilot. I, you know, I've known Chris, the creator for a long time and I know who he is and I know what he wanted to, and he never wanted to wait. And we needed to make sure that we could walk in every morning, the first shots within 15 minutes of call. And, you know, we designed this thing to be uber efficient. And that, uh, at the end of the day, because it was so efficient, the creativity was so much more, you know, in the front because no one had to wait for things. We weren't trying to figure out how to do this or that because it was there. So we could actually focus on the, the telling of the story and how to move the camera and how the light works in this or the, you know, this or that. And um, it's, it was truly a blessing to, to have it done this way with so much, obviously um, kind of backing by the producers. I mean, they, the moment we talked about this, they were like 100%, let's make this the, the best streamlined system we possibly could. It also sort of parallels the story <laughs> of the bear totally. too. I mean, it's yeah. like you, you couldn't have a more parallel story between the crew behind the scenes and what they're filming because it's all about efficiency. And 100%. I love that. I, I think now it could be wrong. Cause I, I research a couple episodes at the same time, but I believe in my research on you and this show is that you were working at eight to 10 hour days. Is we that were. correct? Yeah. Like we, we yeah. I, I abs- that, now that like that speaks to me so much because I feel like oftentimes you hear these horror stories about people working 16, 18 hours a day. And it's like people get obsessed with this idea that you have your work. You, you have to work yourself to the absolute bone to be like a real movie or a real TV show. And yeah. it's just it's crazy to me. I, I think working with efficiency getting the most out of your day, getting the most out of your crew and letting people go home and rest and relax. Like that to me is the right way to do this. I agree 100%. We all felt that same way. You know, people wanted to go and have dinners. People wanted to get home to their families. You know, we had days where we were, we were effectively shooting out the page count within six to seven hours. And what the opportunity we got from that was, is we got to spend two hours shooting food. And so we would bring in off schedule, you know, bring the chicken in or let's do jardinier or let's do, you know, the risotto dish. And, you know, the chefs would come in and Jeremy or IO or, whoever, or you know, Lyle, whoever is a part of that thing, they would prep it and cook it themselves. And they were the on set camera for, for hands and for face. And like no one came in and did it for them. And so like the fact that the actors did the extra like shots at the end of each day's scheduled stuff was incredible because then we had the opportunity for, you know, let's go from the hands and go up from the hands to the face and connecting that kind of precision, you know, work in a kitchen to the actor's eyes is what sells it. But that yeah. was that was kind of the amazing thing is is like we would do we do short day not short days but relatively in our business we do days that were not obnoxiously long because we weren't getting the content we needed is because we were working at a hundred percent 
everyone was super focused and super, you know, they, they felt like this was their show. Everyone felt a part of it. And so we were knocking it out quick. And then we knocked out the food or the inserts or whatever it was. And we would go home at nine or 10 and come back the next morning at seven. You know, Chris wanted to have a seven to five. Like he wanted this, this lifestyle for people to also live. And I think that was so well received and people just, the crew loved it. And, you know, it's a full request, you know, the entire crew is coming back for season two. There is no one not coming back. Mm, I love hearing that. Did you have yeah. experience filming or, fil or filming or photographing food before? I have. So my background <clears throat> with Chris as a, the creator is we, for a decade, 10, 11 years go back of doing a lot of um, kind of, you know, consulting slash like for higher work with Michelin star chefs and restaurants where we would go in and do kind of mini documentaries that that company would kind of use for promotional internal stuff. So uh, I think it's like 10 years to the date we did a week at the French laundry of Thomas Keller. And there's a short film that we made from that, which feels very kind of relevant to this show. Um, so we, me and Chris have this language of food and the pacing and the way that the chefs move through the kitchen and the, the vocabulary. So like there was a very second nature kind of, we knew how it worked in a kitchen we knew how the, how the people move through it and, um, that kind of ballet of what's happening. And so it only allowed us to kind of focus on how that camera would move through the space in that same kind of parallel ballet. And so whether it was they were going one way, we would go the other. And it was, it always felt right. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm lucky for that. And I think I'm lucky that we spent so much time in kitchens previously and big, you know, really good kitchens. Do you have any tips for, you know, aspiring food photographers, food videographers, or people that just happen to have maybe a scene that pops up in their commercial or their film? I mean, what have you learned from all this experience and how did you apply it? What, what are some tips? Um, I mean, from the very beginning, we always chose to go with more of like a medium prime lens and just kind of get in there with these, these chefs. They are so focused on what they're doing that I think immediately, um, you know, photographers and whoever think that they need to be very far away in a long lens. And you, the thing is, is that you want to be intimate and you want to feel like you're a part of what they're doing, their process. And so the, the closer you can get to them, the more you're into that space and the more you feel like you feel their arms moving through the frame. I think there's a connective tissue there that, um, in, in my opinion, feels more natural to it. Um, you know, there's two worlds here. Like we have a good friend, Adam, who, who has done all of, you know, the, the chef's table stuff. And he's creating some of the most gorgeous food photography in the world. And then I think the bear came in and we shot food, you know, as almost as raw as possible. And, you know, there's no right or wrong here because I, I, I don't think I could do it how he does it. He does it so well that well, that's what I mean. It's like, I can't tell somebody well, you did, the right way of doing it. Well, you can tell people your way of doing it. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned that you shot it very raw because that is, if I had to put this show, if I had to take the cinematography and boil it down to one word, it would probably be well, either raw or chaos. <laughs> it's like one of those two. But then I also think that there is a peacefulness and a calmness in some of the cinematography as well. And yeah. even in the food photography, like in the last episode, we're in Sydney's house and, yeah. you know, she's she's cooking or even when we're it seems as though anytime we're outside of that kitchen, things are calmer. Things are more mm -hmm. settled. You know, the camera isn't moving so much when you go in that kitchen. It's a different world. It's like it's yeah. it's it's crazy. Am I on to something? Is that intended? You are. Is that all right? So no, can you talk to intended. me about that in and, and the reasons for it? That was one of the very first conversations that Chris and Chris had with me is that he wants the world to feel different. And so when we leave a kitchen, we leave the beef, whatever it is, the world needs to, if the camera moves, it has to move purposefully with those actors in a way that it's invisible. And so if there, if the camera's not moving, it's still, and it, it's beautiful frames, it's good lighting. It is a it is a time for the audience to almost allow them to reset. 
And so if we didn't do that so well, then the chaos of that kitchen would have probably overwhelmed the audience, which I think it still does a little bit. But yes, that kitchen is designed to never stop moving, except for maybe the family meals. Mm -hmm. And I think the family meals are an exception because they do feel like it is a moment of calm. But outside of that, truly, that camera moved constantly. And we shot them on longer lenses in the kitchen and wider lenses out of the kitchen. So there is a lot being done to subconsciously push the audience in different emotional directions. What did you film the bear on? We shot on a mini LF, which is a, a, you know an airy camera. We shot it full format. Um, I We shot two stops overexposed, so 3200 ISO, which is the highest it can go on in camera, purposefully to add as much grain and dancing kind of texture to the highlights and shadows, um, trying to push it as far as possible on a negative standpoint, knowing that when it goes to color, um, we don't have to add it in post. We wanted it to be natural. Um, and then I shot it on Panavision lenses, a, a, a set that I've been shooting on for some time now. They're H series, they're primes. Um, they are kind of my pride and joy over there. They've Panavision has been very great you know, they've been great to me and they, they have been holding certain serial numbers that, of the H's that I love. Um, and so it was, we held three different 50 millimeters on that show and each 50 had different characteristics for different moments that we wanted to do, knowing that the 50 mil on full format was our, our hero uh, lens for telling the story. And then we had B camera on in a pan, in, an old 70s Panavision 11 to 1 that was uh, expanded to fit the full format. Oh, that's awesome. And we, we actually have quite a few questions about the lighting. And I want to talk about that next because, um, let's see, Fabrizio Diaz asked a couple of questions about lighting. And, and these two may be they, these two may be related, so I'll ask them at the same time. But one is, how do you keep consistency of lighting on the space, like in a kitchen, to make it look beautiful but also gritty? So how do you keep consistency? And he also wants to know the way that you're extending window lighting in scenes like when they're all eating together uh, for the family dinners and all that. So just general thoughts on your you know, lighting design for the show, and thank you, Fabrizio, for that question. Yeah, yeah, the um, I have, you know, been lucky enough. I, my, my gaffer, Jeremy Long and I have been working together for, for many years. And, you know, we knew immediately that this kitchen needed to feel fluorescent. And so with it being a stage build, we had, you know, the great, you know, the ability to run all our own tubes. So we ran over 150 Astera four foot tubes inside the ceiling of the beef, all the stairs, the Titan tubes are, full RGB LED, uh, hundred percent dimmable, and they all run through our, our dimming board. So, you know, f the fluorescent overheads is why, what we were able to create consistency. But what's nice about that is, is you know, ju let's just take the kitchen in the back corner as an example, right? So we have 60 tubes in there in a grid situation, and I can take that grid and create gradients from left to from front to back or left to right, I can color change things. And so we were able to really paint the kind of light that was hitting them. So if we knew that they were working the aisle between the ovens and the cold prep, those overheads would go down while the aisle on the other side would go up. And this allowed us to always have a, a stronger edge, kind of keeping that light, wrapping them at all times. Um, or, you know, the dishwashing station in the back corner, we ran very blue versus the rest of the kitchen, which kind of had a greenish, you know, neutral tint. Um, so from a consistency standpoint, that's kind of like we would have these these worlds kind of dialed in. You know, there was the the bakery and the, the, the dishwashing station and the hot prep and the cold prep and the pass through. And um, each one had its own levels, but we could then uh, globally raise everything percentage wise. So, you know. JLo and I, Jeremy, we, I call him JLo, we would be walking through the set and, you know, it, within seconds, right? You know, actors are, are blocking through. Jeremy is, 
you know, doing like, you know, on his walkie and our dim board ops walking off an iPad and we're doing 10% down, 10% down, 5% up, 100% there, you know, it's so quick and it's so efficient, you know, blue or warmer. And, you know, that's kind of what we would do. And then we would always save that look to the scene number. So like, you know, we come back to uh, a world that we felt was natural. We could bring it right back right away. Um, and so that's kind of like a, the fluorescent overhead is really what kept the space, um, this, this kind of softness of what it is, but it allowed a lot of contrast as well, because then I would always call like the eye lights, the, the in-camera lights, which would be the, the tungsten bulbs hanging off of the shelves, or there was, you know, fluorescence on the wall above the sinks, um, little things like just these kind of really warm hot spots that would you know, bloom the lens here or flare it over here or, you know, add a little bit of an eye light. And so those were always constantly being adjusted as well to, to help or, or, you know, take away in these, these scenes kind of things, you know, um, Sydney's characters expo station had, you know, a 150 watt tungsten bulb that was on a smart dimmer right at her. So that, that light's constantly going up and down depending on, how much she's working there. And we always are adjusting its, its angle of approach. So it was always bouncing off of something. I think we actually melted the, uh, the ticket, you know, the plastic box that shoots the tickets out. It's like one day we found that thing melted in half because the bulb was so hot. And so it's like, you know, we're, we're constantly just playing with these lights, knowing that the, the fluorescent overheads was our, our constant. And then in terms of, you know, bringing sunlight in, we always kind of wanted this really rich, warm sun glow whether it was like morning or afternoon it always felt like the kitchens are are running at its 100 percent. whether it was in the morning when they just get there or it's right before dinner service so we kind of went with the feeling of we we ran you know a handful of of tungsten airy maxes on the outside just bringing in as much light as possible and they all had a full correction to make it even warmer with um with some straw, which is uh, CTS. So that was giving us that super rich, that super warm, hard light coming into the dining room and the front windows of the, of the house. So, you know, it's like, I'm trying to play with the extremes of this golden, nat this golden kind of tungsten light with this much more cooler bluish um, fluorescent light. And I thought like that would really give you the contrast to like the cuts of warmth on the bottom and like the bluer cool tones on the face when they are in the front and in the back, it just allowed it to kind of give us some ambient lifts through those, the doors and the windows. Yeah, I thought you guys did such a great job of not having what really would be flat lighting look flat at all. Like it had so much dimension to it and yeah. it was just so, it, it just, so beautifully done. We've got a lot of questions about camera motion as well, camera movement that I wanted to ask you, particularly one from Edward Vega on Instagram. So thank you for the question. Um, any measures taken to make sure handheld shots don't feel too shaky, quote unquote, and also wanted to know the lens package used on the handheld. We talked about lenses, but uh, let's talk about just your whole philosophy with handheld shooting for this show, because I do think that he's right. There is a point where you can make something feel too shaky and you start disconnecting from it. You guys never seem to cross that line. I'd love to yep. learn more about it. Well, I mean, you know, Gary, my A operator would love, would love for me to say that it just honestly comes down to good operating. But at the end of the day, this show is probably 85, 80% dolly work. So that the handheld is very precision in terms of its choices. Um, it pops in a few times through two through six, seven, which is the one is all handheld. And then eight, we have no handheld. So it was really in a sense that we wanted to just give a little bit of, like, we love the term sense of urgency. It's an old Thomas Keller term. He has it above all his clocks in his restaurant. We had, on our, we had it on our monitors. Like, sense of urgency is a wonderful kind of motto in our business because I feel like no one has a sense of urgency in film business. It's always hurry up and wait. Mm -hmm. And so, like, the sense of urgency for us was that there's moments in this film where there's just a little bit of extra motion that needs to happen. And we, we, we brought a little handheld into it, but we really wanted to stick to the kind of um, visual philosophy behind 
camera movement, which was all Dolly. We wanted to really harness that. Chris and I love the movies of like Michael Mann and, you know, Martin Scorsese. Obviously, these dollies are perfectly chosen, but they're not perfectly used. You know, like there's there's roughness to their dollies. Um, and I think that in our modern kind of filmmaking, the dollies being the dolly, even steady cam, the movement, the, the smooth movement is being kind of hyper criticized in a sense that if it's not perfect, it shouldn't be used where we're not in that, that kind of camp. So our handheld by Gary is almost too good. Like there's a lot of talk out there that people think 107, the one or is steady cam. And it's just, it isn't possible. It, the, the kitchen's too small and he gets into places that a steady cam post would hit, or, you know, it literally is not a possible shot. Those hand cat, we, we spent multiple days trying to figure out, the best mode of transportation as you want to call it for this camera to move through the space and handheld was the only option. And so he put it on his shoulder and did six 22 minute takes, you know, well, let, he, let's talk about episode seven because it, you know, far and away the most questions we got from our, our yeah. listeners. And I know for you as well, cause I've read a lot of your interviews and I know that everybody's interested in episode seven yeah. as am I, this is the one episode. It is a yeah. single take for most of it. I think just a couple of minutes at the beginning of the episode, you know, or just B-roll of Chicago and all that. Exactly. Um, but it, it just so brilliantly done. And we've got a few questions about this. One of them that I'm very curious about is, are there any hidden cuts? Because I didn't notice any, but I'm no. curious. Not There's one. no hidden cuts. No. <laughs> it is designed. That's so satisfying per- yes. too. Yes. It is designed purposefully to be a one and that we took a lot of pride into making sure that no one realized it was a wonder. And I think that's the biggest kind of takeaway to this is that even us as a crew watching that video village, you know, my speed camera operators, they're taking notes and helping Gary almost like a co- sideline coach. And he to this day is like, I, you know, we knew it was a wonder. We designed it as a wonder, but I didn't understand it was a wonder until eight or nine minutes in. And I think there's a very kind of similar, uh, uh, you know, feedback that's happening is that a lot of people don't see it as a one and they think, you know, there's a cutter here and there, but I think it comes down to Chris as our, our director in the episode, obviously our creator showrunner is that he had such a wonderful, uh, kind of point of view, understanding that this episode works in one take but it's not in a sense to show off. There's nothing really showing off it. What it is, is it's putting you as an audience in the, you know, basically on the ride through the chaos of what is very naturally happens in these kitchens. And I think that it actually would have been a disservice to that episode to cut it up because for what happens and how it happens and how it unfolds you on that kind of roller coaster ride is the only way to truly understand what, you know, the restaurant workers go through day in and day out. Yeah. You almost like the, the, the episode is so wild and I'm, I can only assume that people listening to this have seen it. Um, but you almost feel like you're going to get yelled at. Like when you're, when yeah. you're as you as the viewer through the lens of the camera, you almost feel like I shouldn't be here. Like I'm in the way. <laughs> it's sort of yeah. how you feel. And I think that just lends itself so much to this one or take where th- there's almost times where you feel like the camera's going to like bump into someone or get pushed out of the way or something. It feels so real in that scene. It's mm-hmm. just fantastic. So let's, ch- let's just talk about kind of the way that you approach this because you had mentioned earlier, it's not just a show off. It actually supports the storyline, which I think is great. But talk to me about the way that you, you know, it's going to be a one you know, you got a 20 minute scene to film in one take. How do you plan for something like this? Um, you know, Chris came to us like two or three weeks before we shot it. So this was not to be clear. This was not planned in prep. Really? So this was like, this was a moment that he had kind of like probably that dream awakening situation where he's like, this makes sense to me and I need to quickly pivot and we need to figure this out as soon as possible. So I let, he did his thing with the writers and Joanna, they did an amazing job rewriting the script. You know, we, I think we were shooting episode five at this point. You know, again, 27 days. So we're 10 weeks, 10 days out, eight days out from filming episode seven. Um, At that point, 
Gary and I, Gary, my A operator, started kind of exploring the kitchen, trying to walk through the space with lens and like trying to figure out what lens made most sense. How can we hold a two shot, but also get a single, but also get a close up of food, but also, you know, it's like there's so many requirements in, you know, if you were to look at a, a, a episode shot, we're showing you as an audience so many variations of size frames. We needed a lens that could do it. And we didn't know how to do it yet. So it really came down to the first thing is, is what lens can do this and how can we accomplish it? And so, you know, we, I started calling Panavision. I'm like, what can I, what can you find me? I need a lens that's, you know, that's fast. I need a lens that's roughly around 50 millimeters and I need a close focus of 14 inches. You know, Panavision lenses are historically two feet minimum close focus, regardless of series. It's just how they've done things. Um, we would carry diopters on our show purposely so we can get closer focus on stuff. But a diopter in a one or doesn't work. We have to get to infinity. We have to get to close focus. So Panavision started going through their inventory. Um, Guy and Dan started trying to figure out what they have and what they can do. And they finally found something that worked. So they sent it out to us a couple days. You know, we had two days or something before we started shooting. And it finally got to us. And we started doing tests and it worked. So that was the that was number one for me was I couldn't get in a situation that I couldn't provide a frame, a composition that we needed to successfully get from, you know, minute, you know, second one to minute 22. Right. What was the lens? What was the focal like? 50 mil. Oh, OK. Yeah, we, so we, we found a 50 millimeter. Uh, it was a it was a T2. So it wasn't as fast as some of their faster lenses, but it still was in the family of the, 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 the standards and supers, which are the H series. H is just to quickly clarify H series from Panavision is a curated collection of standards supers from the sixties, 50s, 60s, 70s. It's um, and they cover full format. So we were able to find something that worked. It was it was not necessarily a one-off, but it was a, a low production lens. Um, and a 50 millimeter running through a kitchen is what we've been doing. So it, it aesthetically matched the language of the show. I think that was the key. Hmm. You know, we weren't changing the visual language. And so it wouldn't, I think immediately that way, the audience wouldn't think there's something different happening. Um, yeah. And, and I, and I, I felt that too. I, I say that, now, I hope you're taking this as a compliment, yeah. but I did notice that there is a different look to that episode. Like the kitchen seems a little bit flatter. The lighting seems flatter. Uh -huh. It seems a little bit brighter overall, but yeah. I kind of felt like that was in an attempt to make it even more realistic as you roam through this kitchen. Like it did feel yeah. like a special day in the kitchen, not just the run of the mill day for sure uh, because a lot happens so uh, i did feel like some things were in an and i'm actually it's more of a question for you is that that sense of a little bit more flat that sense of a little bit brighter were those things done intentionally to support the storyline were they done because just you had to do it for the lens you were using for the camera package for how much moving around you were doing or maybe a little bit of both um, no, no, this was a fully just uh, choice that we made. So if you go back to episode two, when Jeremy has the flashback in his fancy kitchen, mm. those shots were very bright, very white and very yes. low contrast. And so we wanted to show, so episodes two through seven slowly get brighter. So two is the most contrasty episode. Seven is the least contrast, also the brightest. And so we wanted to show that Carmi was slowly losing control again. And so mm -hmm. when we got to seven, Carmi lost it. Mm -hmm. And it was bright. It was out of control. It was almost as if like he was losing sight of everything else. Um, Jeremy, our, you know, Jeremy was... So we set up our dimming board with two boards. So both Jeremy and Trevor, our board operator, were doing live grading on the lights so i don't he doesn't even know how many cues he was doing but he basically was sitting there like an audio mixer adjusting lights the entire time 
darkening mm-hmm. this corner, lighting this corner while we're flying around this space. So there, I think there is probably a, a, a color version of that episode that matches more to the show. But I think creatively we had this idea and we were hoping it would work that it would feel like that's when he lost control and, and seeing if people would parallel connect that to the days of his, of running that fancy restaurant. I didn't make that connection, but I also think it's because there was so much time between when I saw episode two and when I saw episode Mm -hmm. seven. And, um, but now that you say it, it does make so much sense because I do remember that scene, that flashback scene in episode two and almost like the, um, it, it, like the surgical, it almost felt like you were you were in surgery yeah. or something. It was For so sure. bright that yeah, that's interesting. I love hearing yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's it was fun. You know, I think I think there's that's what we liked about this show so much is that there's a, it's so much deeper. We could visually kind of play with the deepness of what's happening, and it, it really worked well. Oh, it certainly did. I want to just talk just a touch more about episode seven because I want to sort Please. of get my head around the structure of your crew. I mean, there's yes. very little room. I know, yes, you built a set, but which is incredible, by the way. Your set design people are amazing. I'm looking yes. at that set just as an aside. I'm looking at that set and I'm saying, all right, this has to be a real location because nobody would ever build a set this tight and congested when you have the ability to give the crew room. Why would yeah. you do this? <laughs> but yeah. it, but it was interesting to see that it was a set. But I think, I mean, that's just an aside, but my God, those people, A plus to that whole crew that built that. But Truly. It, it, lending, you know, that all kind of leads up to my question, which is you have so little room. Everybody's on top of each other. This has to be a dance. It has to be choreographed perfectly. Mm-hmm. So, how, what is the makeup of your crew? And particularly, I'm interested in the communication. Like, how are you communicating yeah. with this crew? Um, well, I'm a little bit old school where I don't do the HMEs. I don't do headsets. I have this weird kind of philosophy that the conversations that I have with my people are face-to-face before we do the work. It's not giving them any direction while they're doing the work. These are, you know... W- I give my people a whole bunch of trust and creative ability where if, if I got in their ear middle of a take and I'm like, pan left, pan left, like that takes them out of what they're doing. So that being said, that's just kind of my philosophy on crew management, but this, the, the one itself, this episode seven, um, we spent, we really didn't spend that much time rehearsing, but if you want the timeline real quick, Day, day one was actors in a circle on set in, in the, the uh, dining room, reading the words, working through it while myself and Gary and crew are in the main kitchen. And we're just basically trying to figure out, uh, with Chris going in and out, trying to figure out like, okay, there's 10 scenes or 11 scenes in the script. And each scene makes sense and try to figure out where these scenes are. So we started placing scenes, right? And so by the end of day one, Chris, with Chris's, you know, influence, and he really understood kind of, we basically built like a horseshoe. So we built these scenes so each one would connect to each other. So we weren't like jumping from one side of the kitchen and then coming back and then going across. We wanted to kind of horseshoe it so that the story pulled the camera all the way to the front and pulled it back all the way to the back. So that way it wasn't, we didn't want empty air and there's only like very few moments where there's empty air, but it's because someone's calling out to bring them in. And so it was like the camera's moving purposefully with the motion of the actors. So that first day was trying to figure out where are we, where are we living? Where are we looking? And then day two is when the actors came in and we still put no cameras up on day two. It was literally just letting the actors work through the space while the principal crew was in there with them, kind of walking with them, understanding where they're going to be, understanding where the camera's looking. And at the end of the day, you know, day three is when we filmed it. You know, we have um, no one ever talks about, but we have Joe, our boom operator, who is not in the shot once, which is unbelievable. We have our Dolly Grip, who is spotting Gary. We have Gary, our, our camera operator. And that's it. There's three people. Everyone else is on the outside of the stage. So we built the stage with a big platform that surrounded the whole stage. So we could put all the crew 
around the outside. So we had like a whole wall of like basically focus pullers and DIT and camera carts. And so we closed all the holes up so we can't see outside of the stage. And Matt Rosick, who's our, our focus puller for a camera pulled focus from the, from not being in there. So he wow. pulled as it's a video game. And again, you've seen it. We've seen it. There is not one miss and it is a incredible feat. Not only that, though, he made creative choices in there that we weren't telling him to do that worked for the storyline. Staying of Richie, he never went to Sydney. You know, when, he, you know, th- there's a there's a shot at like, I think, minute 18 or 17 that Gary, the camera rushes in on Carmi. So it's a it's a 15 foot push in that, you know, you throw on a focus puller 16 or 18 minutes into a take. Now you have to do a, a perfect push in focus pull that anyone would do normally on set five, six times, right? To get it perfect. I mean, the, the guy in lights out hits it every time. Amazing. You know, you know, you know, 20 minutes in, and you're just like, what is going on? It just, the, the clicks were perfect. And I think at the end of the day, it was just, um, people were very invested in this and, and wanted to see it, see it through. Do you think that the, 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 sp- I guess the lack of prep in the more spontaneous, just the whole idea yeah. of that scene was, the whole idea of that episode was, lended itself to just somehow magically everybody just getting it right. I mean, <laughs> there is something to not planning and just going for it that I think works sometimes. I agree. I mean, you know, Gary always jokes that I'm I'm endlessly optimistic in a sense of how I ask for things on set. As if like, you know, he jokes, he's like, well, you do know that you've asked for five things today that are not possible and you walked away as if it's like we should be able to do it in an instant. But it's like, to me, it's like I give them that kind of ability to then figure out how to achieve it, how to execute it. And it now becomes theirs. And I think that this was that kind of situation where – yeah, of course, that like, you know, whatever, I helped build this thing, but this is truly execution by incredible uh, technical filmmakers, hmm. you know, on top of, you know, a cast that's lights out. You know, th- yeah. this is, if this was a show about talking about the show and the cast, like we would, we don't even matter because they're that good. But because this is a technical conversation, I'm so lucky to have the best in Chicago. And Maddie Matheson. Who I didn't I mean, even, the best. I didn't, I honestly, I just found out who that person was, <laughs> no joke, two days ago, because I was on, I was on the phone with um, a, a client of ours, uh, Sarah Fennell, her company's called Broma Bakery, and she actually just approached yeah. us to do a cooking YouTube series for her. My, she approached Amazing. my company, and she used that, she sent a link of Maddie Matheson as a reference, and I was like, <laughs> wait a minute, why do I know that guy? I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't believe it. And now it's just opened up a whole new door of this. It's like, there's too much content. The last thing I needed was another thing I want, I need to watch and want to watch, but regardless, he's, a, he's incredible. I, I digress, but wow. I mean, your cast, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And yeah. you know, the show isn't certainly isn't about acting and, and uh, you know, um, you know, all that kind of stuff, but without a cast, you, you have very little to shoot. <laughs> I, mean, I guess you can yeah, close or, up some food, but you need a solid right. cast, especially in yes. an episode like episode seven. So hats yes. off to all of those people. And I do appreciate that you kind of spreading, spreading the wealth with that because um, it isn't just a one person situation. You have a whole no. team behind you. So I love that. So we're, we're getting to the end of our interview, but I wanted to ask you about, I always ask everybody that comes on, um, yeah. to give us a couple of scenes that they want to talk about or that they're particularly proud of. And of course, you you mentioned episode seven, which we talked yeah. a lot about. But then you also mentioned these two scenes that I thought were very interesting because you mentioned um, a scene in episode six, the very last scene of episode six. You also yeah. mentioned a scene in episode two where Sydney and Richie are in the car and Richie gets a call from his daughter. Both of these scenes, if you've seen the show, are very, they're very personal. They are simple. They are dialogue scenes. And I always find it interesting when cinematographers bring up those types of scenes because from the outside looking in, you don't think there's necessarily a lot of like cinematography, you know, skills in those scenes because they're they're very simple. They're very character driven and, and, and sort of dialogue driven. But I love it when when cinematographers bring those types of scenes up because it shows me that your commitment to the show is the story 
and is yeah. the character and all of that. So I, I'd love to just give you an opportunity to talk about those scenes and why you yeah. chose them. Yeah. So episode three is, or episode two, there's a really special moment. The reason I brought it up is because I do believe in happy accidents. I believe that, you know, things happen for a reason. This is a scene between Sydney and Richie. They're in the car. This is, you know, he gets a phone call and it's, you know, it's a very emotional moment. And this scene's being covered of two cameras. Uh, obviously the camera that's on Richie in the cut is not his camera. That camera was supposed to be Sydney's camera. And that first take happens and the focus stays. Richie pulled himself to the window to kind of isolate himself from her on this phone call. And the focus immediately went with him from our, our B camera folks were Hunter and Hunter made this choice, this creative choice that lived in the cut. And it was, we all stood at the monitors and this was something that we didn't even anticipate or think of. And we watched in awe the most incredible performance that we saw up to that point. And the reason it was so powerful is because it didn't, again, it didn't cut. It's allowing the audience to almost like feel that emotion even more. And I think that's what I love so much about it. The first time we cut is after he gets off the phone call and we cut to cut to her. And it, it, and you can see how broken she is with that, that system or what happened. And to me, that's why I love it. I love it because again, it's a, it's an unplanned, you know, visual cue that, you know, a creative person who isn't necessarily considered creative in from producers or whoever made a choice that was to me, one of the best visual choices of the show. Yeah. I, I that's agree. Why I love it. And it, it's such a great moment because your only impression of this guy from episode one is that he's a total ass. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. this moment makes you see like, all right, there's more there. There's like, I kind of, there's more there. And I love it. Um, and, and the other scene that you mentioned in, in episode six, that sort of final scene as you as you yeah. leave the episode, why did that come to mind as one of your favorites? To me, it, it, this is this is the moment before seven happens that you as an audience is like, okay, so they figured this out. This is the first time they all work in unison. They create a dish from start to finish, and it's beautiful. And what I love about it is that we choreographed. A, a way that camera moved that watched the, the creation of this dish again without cutting. Again, it's, it's, it, it shows the true performance from the actors. They're, they're executing this, you know, willingly on their end. You know, it's going from, I think it incorporates um, six of our principals who all touch the dish, whether it's from, you know, the, the onions and peppers to the chicken, to the plating, to Sydney wiping it, to putting it on the expedite to, you know, you know, it's just an incredible dance. And, you know, obviously who can't deny the John Mayer on top of it just makes it even better. But like, this is a, this is just, this is a moment in the show that feels free. It, it feels like, it's it, it's like a celebration of what they've accomplished up until that point. And again, it's another moment that we didn't, this came out of Courtney store, Chris's sister, who was our other food consultant. Courtney is a very established chef in Los Angeles. She ran in John, she ran John and Vinny's. She is an incredible, incredible person. And so she, at that point, was handling this scene from the food consulting side of things. She was prepping all the food, getting them all ready. And me and her kind of looked at each other and were like, is this an opportunity? And she's like, yes, this is the time that you want to show them working as a team. And so we choreographed this kind of one within minutes. Like, I think we had it together in five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, that was not planned. It was not scripted. It was not... There was nowhere that it was asked to do. And she threw this idea at us and we just went with it. And again, I think it's that a beautiful collaboration between a lot of different people at once, um, kind of celebrating the, the essence of the show. I am shocked that that wasn't planned because it seems like such a brilliant lead into what episode seven turned out yeah. to be. Uh, yeah. So that's, you know, if you ever want to, 
I, I guess the, the moral of the story here is if you want to work on a set where there's absolutely no planning and you still get home in eight or ten hours, it's one of your sets. <laughs> Well, you know, let's be honest. There's plenty of planning, but I think the key, the key, the key to happy and successful filmmaking is is having the ability to say no, say yes, and just throw a plan away and go with your gut in the moment. I love that. Well, the show is called yeah. The Bear. It's on FX and, of course, on Hulu as well. And it sounds like the whole gang is back for season two. And, yeah. God, the use of music in this show. I heard Counting Crows in there. I heard Jeremy. Like, yeah. the best use of Radiohead's Let Down at the very end. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's too much. And I brought you a gift. Stop it. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Do you see it? Hold on. It's, it's, oh, it, it's so crazy because... I noticed these cans because these are what I use. Yeah, that's and I a whole saw field, them, right? I saw, yeah, whole field. Whole I saw field, them. Yeah. I saw them everywhere in the in the yeah. kitchen. I'm like, all right, these guys are pushing this can of tomatoes so it's hard. Something is going on here, and then of course it does. You know, no spoilers, even though I think everybody has seen the show. But this, if you start noticing these all over the kitchen, there's a reason. And there's a huge payoff at the end, and I absolutely love that. So here you go, from from me to you. There's nothing fun in it, but here you go. No, of course, except for good tomatoes. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> well, it was a joy talking to you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Thank you. Where can people find you online? Uh, AndrewWade.com, or uh, I think it's Andrew Wade, uh, my Instagram handle. So either one. There it is, Andrew Wade, W E H. D-E, and I'll put a link to all that stuff in the show notes, awesome. guys. And thank you for your questions, everybody. Thanks, and thank man. you, Andrew, for being on the show. And congratulations on such a thank huge so success much. with the bear. Thank you. All right, I want to thank Andrew Wade, the director of photography of The Bear, for coming on the show and talking to us today. I learned so much from him, and I especially, I think the biggest takeaway for me is how efficient that crew was how eight, 10 hour days they were able to get everything done. Like that, that is near and dear to my heart. That is like anybody that's worked with me knows that is like what I live by. I love being done on time. I love being efficient. I love using every hour on set to ma and really maximizing it and get the most out of it. And I also love going home at a reasonable time. So I, I can totally relate to that. And I very much appreciate the type of work that he does and how he runs his crew. And uh, I hope we all learn lessons from that. I want to mention that you can check out all things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. You can also check out ignitionvisuals.com, which is the home of Connor Crosby, who is our fantastic and fabulous producer. He also produces a whole bunch of stuff for me and my production company, BC Media Productions. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, where you not only get to hear the episodes, but see the episodes, which to me is really the best way to do it because you get to see the person talking. There's so much expression in, uh, in their body language and in their face, and it's just the way to experience Go Creative Show. All things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com, and if you want to follow me, you can find me at Ben Consoli on Instagram. And of course, I want to thank you all for joining us today, and we will see you on the next episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers.